welcome back to uh, our our program. <laughs> I just lost my marbles for a second. Welcome back to the E Crusade. Um, oh, I don't know what's going on there. Just a minute, <clears throat> and I'll get rid of that. I think. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh no. Well, anyway, the issue, the the e-crusade is underway and runs through Friday, August 21st, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific time. We're bringing you continual broadcast daily of the word of God on this year's theme, God knew you before the foundation of the world. We have scheduled a variety of very noted doctors, pastors, ministers to share the word of God and all of its nuances on that subject with you and we won't want to, you won't want to miss any of these uh, e-crusade programs this year. We want you to know that, however, we're archiving those uh, daily broadcasts on Spreaker.com, YouTube.com, Twitter.com, GooglePlus.com, and on our website, TheMastersTouch.org. They're there for your edification, your education, and enjoyment. Join us for the rest of the week through Friday the 21st. To log in, go to Spreaker.com and enter in the search box, Dr. Stephanie E. Crusade. All right, so it's dr. S T E F like Frank E N I then the word E Crusade and it's a small E, capital C R U S A D E and E Crusade is a separate word much together. Don't separate the E from the C. Okay, we look forward to you joining us. Um, I did something unforgivable here. I think I'm not sure. I'll just tell you in a second. Oh, let's see, there it was. Yeah, I surely did. Um, I closed a, my program out the one that I'm using for my notes, my file. So let me just go in really quick and get it because I have to put my glasses on to do that because I don't know where I'm going with this if I don't. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this and then go here and do this. <laughs> oh my, what a day, I'll tell you. And it's hot in my office. It's just miserable. Okay, we're at day two. Open, and let's go down to get this over where it goes, and let's get down to where we're going with the message. Um, and I have to back up so that I know what I'm talking about this afternoon, and then we'll pick it up and, and run with it. But, uh, you know, this technical stuff, it's hard for me because I'm not a techie person, ha, 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 but I just make mistakes all over the place. You just have to bear with me, and I thank you for doing so. Uh, at least we don't have microphones that are squealing, hopefully, you know, and that kind of thing. So we're just going to keep backing up until we get where we're going. And maybe I'll get there sooner or later. Oops. I may get here. I may get here sooner than I thought. <laughs> okay. Here we are. I'm going to talk to you about uh, your unbelief. Now, whenever a problem arises... Many people immediately allow a worry and doubt to creep into their thinking, and um, they don't—they just don't know what the solutions are. However, the solutions to our problems are found in God's Word. Therefore, we should focus more on the Word than on our problems. Amen. Giving our problems attention causes our hearts to harden against God's promises. We must cast down the high thoughts that go against God's Word. High thoughts are norms and values in society that oppose God's words. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, although a certain way of life may be accepted in society, it certainly doesn't mean it's accepted by God. Now, we have to cast down those ideas and concepts that go against God's word, friends. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. You know, God wants us to think on good things, folks. He wants us to have peace of mind, and we can maintain a peace that passes all understanding when we focus on His Word. In Philippians 4, 8 through 9, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. 
you know, natural unbelief comes through our senses, and it comes when what we see, hear, and feel influences us more than the Word of God. For instance, when Jesus' disciples were asked to cast a demon out of a boy, the severity of the situation caused them to come into unbelief. The demon was throwing the boy into convulsions, causing him to foam at the mouth, gnash his teeth, and, and then lie motionless. Mark 9, verses 14 through 18 says this, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately, when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. All right, this type of natural unbelief can be overcome through fasting and prayer, my friends. Matthew 17, 14 through 21 says this, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, contrary to popular belief, we do not fast to move God or the devil. We fast to overcome our senses. Fasting attacks our carnality and causes our souls to line up with our spirits. When we're dominated by the word, we are spiritual. When we are dominated by our senses, we are carnal Christians. So let's take a look at what it means to believe with, heart, with the heart. You know, there's a difference between believing with the heart and trying to understand spiritual things with the intellect. Um... Believing with the heart is what gets results in the kingdom of God. All right, And we believe with the heart. The word heart here is often used as uh, to describe the core of something. Mark 11.23 and Romans 10.10. 10, uh, look those scriptures up. I do your homework. <laughs> That's a challenge for you. The heart of a person is in his or her spirit. The words heart and spirit are sometimes used interchangeably in the Bible, in case you didn't know that. And humans are tripartite beings, which are uh, uh, each of us are as a spirit who has a soul and lives in a physical body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Romans 2.28-29, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, Luke 16, verses 19-25, through 25, and more homework for you to look up. <laughs> the spirit has a soul attached to it, and both the spirit and the soul are intact when we die, even though the physical body becomes lifeless. The soul consists of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, the spirit of a man is a hidden part of him, which cannot be seen. 1 Peter 3, verse 4 says this, Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Romans 7, 22. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So our bodies are referred to as our earthly houses, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared for us the very thing, this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Only humans are made in the likeness of God, my friends. Animals do not have spirits, and they do not have an eternal destination. However, I will say this. I don't like that because it upsets me. I had lovely little pets that have gone on, uh, I say, to be with the Lord. And um, I have prayed about that, and the Lord sent me a 
well, he didn't send me a book, but he had a book sent to me, a tell, giving scripture for that we will get to see our pets again. And uh, in one book that I read was a woman who had gone to heaven, and when she came back, um, she had actually died and gone to heaven, but the Lord sent her back. And during her sojourn there in heaven, she had had a dog that saved her little boy from being hit by a car and was killed. And she said, and she thought of that little dog, you know, and longed to see him. And he just appeared and came up and said hello. And she petted him and they played. And he, and any time she thought of him, he would come from wherever he was, you know. So that is contradictory to the fact that there has to be a spirit or something there. But I believe that it's the will of God that he wants to please us. And that I'm sure he has tucked them away where they belong. And he just brings them to us when we need to have a little shot in the arm. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true. I have no scripture to back it up. But anyway, there you have it. Now, throughout the scriptures, it's revealed in more detail the manner in which God made us in his image. For example, his face and hands are often mentioned in the scriptures, like in Exodus 33, 11 through 23. Angels are also spirits, and as God allows, they can be seen. They can also take on the form of human beings. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, um, John 3, verses 4 through 7 tells us that the Pharisee Nicodemus was confused about the term born again. And he asked Jesus, can he, a man, enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus explained to him that a person's spirit can be born again or made new. We make contact with God with our spirits, not the human intellect or our five senses. Um, God is a spirit, therefore uh, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. Now I'm going to uh, go back here because for a second because I want to tell you a story about something that happened, uh, about angels. Um, and I moved on and I should have uh, not. Uh, when we were talking about uh, angels are spirits and God allows sometimes that they can be seen and they can also take on the form of human beings. Um, I have seen angels. Uh, I have been privileged by God to see them when I needed to for reasons, whatever they were. Um, they are uh, magnificent creatures. But anyway, my husband and I were on a little weekend vacation on our yacht down in, this is when we owned a yacht, we don't anymore. When we were down in Sausalito, and my husband and I uh, were, got tied up at the, the uh, uh, nearest uh, yacht club. And there in San Francisco area, down in, in that area, they had um, uh, a dock that was, f their, their building was floating. And, of course, the, the tide would go out. And then they had humongous drops, like cliffs, where they were, had riprap, which is big boulders, you know, that were placed along like a retaining wall would be to hold the shore from eroding. Well... You walked along this plank to a screen. Uh, it was a metal, heavy metal screen door that locked, and it had wings on it so that <laughs> it keeps anybody from climbing around it or going up and over it or whatever. And when we went out that gate, we weren't given a key, and they didn't tell us, well, you have to call to have us let you in. And we were talked to, to, tied on their dock. So my husband had on flip-flops, and we'd been into, into town and shopping and whatnot, and we would come back to, to get on the boat. And um, when we did, why that we were locked out. So we called the called out to over the thing to somebody to come open the gate. Well, nobody opened the gate, and nobody came, and there wasn't didn't seem to be anybody around. And this gate was locked, and we had our boat there. We had to get home and and get on the boat anyway. So my husband said, "Well, I'll um, I'll walk around it." I'll climb up and over it. I said, oh, don't do that. Well, when he was, he walked up and this gate, they had a, a like a fence that ran along. It was a, the same kind of material, that metal fence mesh like screen, but uh, that ran along this long dock with, that we were walking on to get to this gate. And he, it was not really high enough. It, I thought it was a little low just looking at it. So anyway, he leaned out over the edge of it to look around the wings that were on that door, the gate, the gate. And when he did, it hit him in the wrong place on his leg, and it threw him off those shoes. He lost his balance, and he went over the edge, and he fell down. There, the tide was out, and there must have been at least 20 feet of a fall. I'm not exaggerating. And he landed and flopped on his back on that riprap, those boulders that were jagged. 
of course, I couldn't get down to him, and so I, I just looked around for the part in the parking lot that was there to see if anybody was there. There wasn't a soul around. This is in Sausalito, and every place is always just swarming with people. Not a person to be found. I dropped to my knees and I started praying and I said, Lord, help me. Now, in the meantime, my husband started breathing erratically and I could hear this rattling noise kind of like and when he was breathing. <clears throat> and I said, Lord, help me. Please help me. Send somebody. I, I don't know what to do. There's nobody here and I can't get down there to him. Okay. Out of nowhere, I mean absolutely nowhere, a man walked up next to me, redheaded, very nice looking, and he said, of course, by now I'm standing, and he said, what's the matter? I'm a medical doctor. Maybe I can help. And, I, and he, uh, he had kind of an accent. And I said, my husband fell down the thing, and, and uh, I need help. I need help because he's hurt himself. He's hurt, obviously. He said, oh, all right. And so he, he started to go down the riprap. But I'm, as God is my witness, he didn't walk. He floated just barely off the top of the surface of the, he just floated right down there. And it would have, it was such big boulders you had to climb like you were climbing a mountain. Well, he got down to him immediately and he touched his neck and he stopped making that noise with his breathing. So in the meantime, somebody comes out of the kitchen, uh, of the uh, yacht club. They were in the kitchen and they saw this, me yelling and whatnot and they came out and he said, well, I've, I've called an ambulance, and I said, good, well, make sure you do, because my husband's got, I uh, mean, you know, he's down there. This time, all this time, this guy's working on him, or looks like he's working on him, he's kneeling over him. 911, they called, the ambulance came, and the uh, paramedics, and the f uh, fire department, you know, how they climb and down and stuff, and they took that leader, it took them 10 minutes to climb down that riprap to get to him. And when they got down there, the guy that was there with him was gone. Just disappeared. Angels. Angels. My husband's fine. They told him he actually uh, uh, dislodged the brain from the brain stem slightly, and we thought we were going to, he was either going to be paralyzed the rest of his life or be, you know, just a vegetable or even, I mean, anything could have. We were given all this scenario of the worst cases, and they said all of them or one of them would take place. As it turned out, nothing took place. He's healed and whole and well and completely restored, and he's fine. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Amen. Anyway, that's my story about the angels, and I have many more, but I'm not, but not like that. All right. So, John 3, verses 4 through 7 tells us that the Pharisee Nicodemus was confused about being born again. And he said, can you enter your mother's womb and be born again? You know, like a person. And Jesus said, no. But make contact with God with our spirits, not the human intellect or our five senses. God is the Spirit, therefore, those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Now we'll pick up where we left off. We can pray to God in the Spirit. We can pray in the Spirit. We don't understand what we're saying when we do. Our evidence is found in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 14, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 through 15. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, that the natural man, or the person without knowledge of spiritual things, will consider spiritual things foolish. And we have to trust the Lord with our spirits, not the understanding of our natural minds. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. We have peace within when we believe, trust in, and rely solely on God. And we find our evidence in Hebrews 4, verse 3, Philippians 4, 7, and Isaiah 26, 3. We walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 12, verse 1 through 7 tells us that we must transform our minds by gaining knowledge of the Word of God and that this feeds the inner man and we have a free will. Therefore, we can make the choice to renew our minds with the Word. Now, just as we're responsible for changing our thinking, we are also responsible for bringing our bodies under subjection to God's Word. How, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about believing with your heart. To believe with the heart or spirit means to believe apart from what the intellect and five senses can comprehend. In other words, our spirit man believes beyond what is seen with the natural eye. Our spirits are designed to believe the Word of God despite what circumstances indicate. Therefore, the first step to believing with the Spirit is to feed the Spirit with the Word of God. 
It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from out of the mouth of the God. Matthew 4, verse 4. In this scripture, Jesus was referring to the spirit of man, which is the core of who we are. Our spirit lives by the word of God. Physical food keeps the physical body alive. However, our spirit man or inner man cannot survive without the word. The heart of man is the spirit of man. Therefore, we trust God with the heart. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. You see, the physical body is designed to believe the senses. However, the spirit is designed to believe the word of God. God and his word are one. And when we believe his word, we believe him. Therefore, believing with our spirit is believing beyond what the senses detect. We must decide to believe God with our spirit every day, even in the face of apparent defeat. We must watch the words we say because our words feed our spirits. So let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Ephesians 4.29 we have an inner ear that's directly connected to our spirits, and therefore the words we speak, either positive or negative, deposit good or bad things into our spirit. When we speak words that are corrupt or negative, it grieves the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And we have to write the truth of the Word of God on the tables of our hearts. Proverbs 3.3 3. We write the truth on our hearts by speaking the Word of God. The tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. Psalm 45.1 Therefore, Saying what we believe from the Word of God produces great results. Spiritual things manifest into physical things when we speak faith-filled words. So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Matthew 17, 20. Now, the more time we spend in the Word, the more we starve our doubts. Through the Word, our spirits gain uh, can gain the faith that our intellect cannot obtain. The more highly developed we become in either faith or fear, the quicker we will see results. When we have peace, we are highly developed in faith. When we are stressed out and worried, we are highly developed in fear. I'm going to say that again. When we have peace, we are highly developed in faith. When we are stressed out and worried, we are highly developed in fear. Development in faith does not come by just repeating the word over and over again. As we spend more and more time with the word, we reach an advanced level of faith. You know, God's word can still do everything today that Jesus did when he walked the earth, and God sent his word to heal, deliver, and provide for us. However, we must believe with our hearts that he will do what his word says. In other words, we have to believe God, not believe in him. I mean, we have to believe in him too, but that's all we really do is believe in him. We need to believe him. To believe with the heart means to believe with the spirit, which is the unseen core of a person. And believing with the heart is believing apart from what the physical senses tell us. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4 verse 13. Those of us who are born again are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. When we truly believe God's word, we no longer feel we need Jesus to come down from his throne to deliver us. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Romans 10, verses 6 and 7. Instead, we understand the power of his word. He sent his word to heal and deliver us. The word is able to accomplish whatever he can accomplish. Through his word, we obtain our inheritance, deliverance, healing, provision, and so on. Believing with the heart or the spirit means to believe apart from what is seen in the physical realm. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1, verse 1. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, verse 14. So we see that Jesus is the word in flesh form. Therefore, Jesus and the word are the same. Now, in this context, Jesus represents how the Word, which is spiritual, can manifest in the physical realm. The Word that we apply to our lives can bring forth actual, tangible results. So, um, I think I've done this one. I think, that, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I picked this message up twice. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to move on. 
come on I've got more I have I had uh, put this together hurriedly and I grabbed the same one twice I'm sorry so um, oh boy let me go let me go up here here we go no that's not right is that right oh no me and my lost places anyway folks just bear bear with me here for a minute I'm just totally unbelievable <laughs> yeah that was the, I'm seeing that this is a duplicate I thought perhaps if I went through it I would find something different because like, I'm really big about uh, re recapping and putting stuff that I've already done in the beginning but this is all the same thing <laughs> so I'm just going to keep moving on until I get to where I, uh, I can pick it up. Um, if I could just do it that way. and Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, here we go. I want to talk to you for a minute. Uh, this is... Uh, not the one that I wanted to finish up with. I picked up the wrong one to finish the other. But this is this is where I was headed in the end. Um, as he is, Jesus, so are we in this world. The Word of God says, go, Boldly go to the throne of God and make our petitions known to him and receive what we've asked of him. We have an earthly family that we are a part of, and it's not a question as to where we belong we will quickly say that we are in that family and we'll use our rights in it. Why is it that we don't use our rights as a child of God in his family? You know, why do we shy away from doing that? God has plainly laid out for us what we can have in him, but lack of knowledge or condemnation will separate us from his truth. God's promises are so wonderful that we can hardly believe it, but it would behoove us to believe it, otherwise we won't receive it. You see, when we... Um, when we first began to see what belongs to us in his word, our minds might have started to wonder, can I really have what this word says? Well, yes, we can have it, and that's what, and what's more, we can have it all because there's completeness in Jesus. Uh, if you hear a noise behind me, my sister brought another fan in my office, and it's making too much noise, so... It, it, all right, she says that she's listening through this, and she says it's fine. So anyway... <laughs> um, when we first began to see what belongs to us in his word, our minds might have started, like I said, to wonder if we could really have what the word says. And you know what? We can. We can have it all because there is completeness in Jesus and there's nothing missing nor broken in him. Lack of knowledge can prevent us from achieving our kingdom rights, and so will condemnation. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and for this purpose Jesus came to restore us so that we might obtain our inheritance while we're here on earth. Traditions can also be our, um, well, they can be, uh, I'm trying to think of how I want to put this. Uh, traditions can be our downfall. I'll, I'll say downfall. Just because we have been taught a certain way doesn't mean it's the right way. Okay, so therefore we should evaluate our past teaching to see if it lines up with what, the Word of God. Because if it doesn't line up, we should cast away those things and enter into a lively hope in Christ. Now, as Christ is right now, so are we in this world. There is no sickness in him. He's not depressed. He's not poor. He's not afraid or sad. We should be like him, and the way to do that is to study the Word of God, believe it, and apply it to our lives. You see, it's not about what we think or say, but it's about what he has said. And if we want to live like royalty, then we would need to read his guide. It will tell us how to get there. You know, and it'll give us eternal life. So, when, then when we see that because Jesus is, I am, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. First John 4.17 Remember the purpose of the gospel is to transform our thinking. As Romans 12.1-2 says, it's designed to change our thinking from earthly thinking to eternal thinking. And keep in mind, folks, that eternity is much more than just future. It is the eternal past and future, which includes all the earthly here and now. Ephesians 1.4 says, God chose us before the foundation of the world. 
that's in the past tense. Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what the gospel of the finished work of Christ shows us is this, who we are in Christ. Thus, the scripture that we are looking at today tells us that as Jesus is, we are. Now, this is a big spiritual paradigm for most Christians to embrace because this is because our minds are consumed with who we are in the natural, not in the spiritual. But the truth is that if we will see ourselves in the spirit as God sees us, then we will become more spiritual and less natural. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, the gospel is two things. One, all God has done for us is the fi in the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ, and two, who we are in Jesus because of that finished work. With this in mind, let us uh, let the seed of today's scripture be planted deep down inside you and see it for what it says. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. <laughs> Now, when you think about it in all the natural ways that we can say it, this verse defies human logic. This is true of all the gospel. The gospel, the gospel is the wisdom of... <sighs> what is the matter? Don't touch me. Don't. No, no, leave me alone, please. Please. I'm sorry, folks. I just got startled. Go away, please. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, it's not about what we think or say, but it's about what he said, and if we want to live like royalty, then we would need to read his guide, right? And um, so then we see that because Jesus is, I am. You know what? I, I When I jumped, I lost my place. Well, folks... I'll just back up again. <laughs> this was really important. I was coming to a really important part. Okay. Let me see. Uh, okay. All right. When we think about it in the natural, this verse defies our human logic. And, and actually, that's true about all the gospel. Because the gospel is the wisdom of God, and it's very different from human or worldly wisdom that we hear so much of. Therefore, the gospel is meant to transform our thinking from natural to spiritual ways of seeing, because we're really spiritual beings, remember? This is seeing with gospel eyes. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Satan will do anything to keep us from seeing with gospel eyes. Let me interject right here a rapid response message on bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Our text for this is Ephesians 5, verse 30, and it tells us, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And then when we turn to Luke 24, verse 39, it says, Behold my hands, my feet, and that, that this is, it is my, I myself, handle me, and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. Now, I'm going someplace with this, so hang in there with me. Well, through the Apostle Paul, in Ephesians 5.30, the Holy Spirit is actually referring to Genesis 2, verse 23, where it tells us, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. And what we see here is that God literally took one of Adam's bones and made the body of his wife. Now we can understand some of that because of what we know about DNA today. Her body was exactly like Adam's, except in gender. And Ephesians 5.30 is referring to this because as Adam's wife came out of him, when we are born again, we come out of Jesus. What is our evidence? Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want you to take special notice once again at the word creature or creation. 
This is not a remodeling. This is a new species of being born of a different source or seed. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 explains this clearly. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, you're not a little bit like Jesus. You're exactly like him. You are the blueprint of Jesus. He is the blueprint of the Father. We have the exact same spiritual DNA because we, Jesus, you and me, were born of the Word. But now, what's so exciting about Ephesians 5.30 is that we are not only one with the Spirit of the Lord, we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone. Do you see it? He has given us His bones. Now get this, His bones are not diseased. His flesh has no sickness in it. Are you getting excited? You know, Brother Kenneth Copeland shared from his Washington, D.C. meeting that the Lord gave him a word, and he said the Lord came to him saying this, In my sacrifice I gave you my flesh and my bones. In Romans 12, 1, you gave me your flesh and your bones. I took yours, now you take mine. Well, my friends, hallelujah, I gave him mine, and he gave me his, and I took his bones for all my joints and bones, and I took his flesh for all my flesh. I walk in his divine health, wholeness, and restoration. Look, his flesh has no cancer, no tumors, no fever, no infection. It has no part of the curse. His brain is part of his flesh. It has no memory loss, no Alzheimer's. I take his brain. I have the mind of Christ. And now I have his brain in which that mind of Christ in me can work. Hallelujah. So think about this. We are one spirit with the Lord. We have his flesh. We have his bones. And through Holy, the Holy Spirit, we have his blood. I mean, through, through the Holy Spirit, through Holy Communion. <laughs> and through the Holy Spirit. But through Holy Communion, we have His blood. Now, there are six eyes of faith that I was taught years ago, and I'm going to share them with you right now because they kind of go along with this. I believe, I will, I take it, I have it, I thank you, I forgive. So let's do it right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I believe, I will. I take your flesh. I take your bones. I am one with spirit and spirit with you. I have your blood. You gave it to me. I have your flesh. I have your bones. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. And now I forgive if I have ought against any. That brings us to Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now please take note. This is mercy speaking, friends. Mercy's calling your body holy and acceptable, just as it is. He's calling for it just like it is. Not after you've tried to clean it up. He has given you his body and it's already clean. Give your body up to him. Stop calling my body. Stop calling it my body. It isn't your body. From this day forward, call it my sacrifice. That'll start in motion, Romans 12, 2, the renewing of your mind. This living sacrifice, you, belongs to Jesus. His living sacrifice, his body, belongs to you and to me. Now, here we are again, right back at the beginning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. Look at that. As he is right now, today, this minute, so are we. Where? In heaven? No, it's not referring to heaven. Look at it closely and shout it out, in this world! How is Jesus? Just how is he? Well, he's strong. So are we. He's in abundance. So are we. We are in him, he in Christ, and he is in us. He has victory over sickness and disease. So do we. We had it before the foundation of the world because that's when he gave it to us. He has victory over death. So do we. We had it before the foundation of the world because... That is when he gave it to us. He has given us victory over death. Praise the Lord. My friends, we are called believers. As such, our job is to believe what God says. Again, Jesus' very first sermon was repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1, verse 15. Now, when we have faith in the gospel, Hebrews 4, 2 says, it is of untold profit to us. Jesus says our work is to believe what God says, not what we think. John 6, 29. So let's take a look at it. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who, whom he sent. 1 John 4.17 Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
There are few things in this divine biblical record of deeper significance to the child of God than that statement, as he is. The Lord Jesus Christ in glory, so are we in this world. On referring to it, you will find that the Spirit of God gives this as the reason and the only reason for our having boldness in the day of judgment. Every soul, then, that has or seeks to have this assurance and confidence in view of that impending day will receive with interest any manifestation from God's Word concerning what the Apostle is speaking of. Take note of this. The Holy Spirit refers to a positive and an absolute standing in the sight of God, and this is not in reference to a practice uh, to receive this condition. It is a present, everyday standing or condition with Him of believers while they are in this world. Now, it's true that the Apostle does speak in the same verse of the future, the Day of Judgment, and of the attitude of our souls in relation to it. What is our attitude, or what, that, what is that attitude? Boldness! That condition of attitude should be as prevalent in this present day as it will be in our future. Let's take a look now at the two absolute things right before us here. Number one, the positive perfection of divine love toward us, that three times over, blessed, sources of all of our the source of all of our blessing love with us is made perfect so here's the primary and comparable fact displayed to us in all its priceless value for the deep and constant joy of our hearts that god has not given us merely a down payment or taste of his love he gave no installments however glorious but he has perfected his love toward us the Spirit of God knew all too well the tendency of people's souls to become subjective to truth, which, all right, in its subordinate place is never right, when made the absolute point. So therefore he puts the objective before us in all of its divine precedence. Well then, what is the objective thing here? Take special note of this, because it's important for your soul's supreme comfort and peace. Number one, divine love. Number two, occupied with you. Number three, made perfect toward you. That's his design toward you. That's his uh, affection toward you. That's his attention toward you. Now in the next verse, condescending to our weakness, he comes down to the level of what is purely subjective. Love begets love. And accordingly, our love, that love that is his love, has developed and is touched on. But does the love which is perfect in him who is divine produce perfection of love in us who are human? Alas, no. Notice then three uses of the word perfect. His love towards us is perfect. His love is perfect in itself, verses 17 and 18, where in each case the love is in divine connection. Three, there is a change. It's not said, however, that our love is not perfect. True enough, and hopelessly true, if we have fear we are not perfected in love, that is, in His. This, however, if true, is not hopelessly so, because our normal state is that we are perfected in His love. Love and fear are com incompatible, being essentially opposite in character. So, so long as both dwell in the heart, there is distress of spirit or torment. Why? Because contending forces strive for mastery. See, the Apostle Paul seeks to strengthen our souls in the, in the one so that the other may be expelled. In other words, the Spirit of God educates our souls into so perfect a sense of the divine love that fear will lose its place being cast out. The other absolute thing in verse 17 is that as Christ is, so are we in this world. See, the former was an absolute fact, that love has its aspect towards us in its infinite divine perfection. God is love, and his love to usward is absolutely and essentially perfect. Love us less than he does, he will not, and more than he does, he could not. Nor is this love merely a quality or even the essence of his nature only. No, no, uh-uh. It's an active principle. Accordingly, we have next an absolute result, the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, the work of Christ. Speak of it however you want to. Its results here are focused on um, and in their relationship to the believer. So do we think of ourselves naturally? By that I mean born in sin, conceived in iniquity, by nature lost. Most, I mean, some denominations do. They're continually hammering that on you. Or, or, or do we see ourselves as living in sins and practicing evil? I mean, every soul guilty of, before God is guilty of that. Or do we think of, of or see ourselves even as believers as to our practical state? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And in many things we offend all. But, oh, 
know the wondrous character of the divine love. God, looking upon the face of our shield and his anointed, the glorified man at the right hand of his throne, who is over all, God blessed forever, in spite of all he has ever seen or now sees in us, and the tremendous disparity between him and ourselves, sin and guilt, death and judgment, have been for us, the believers, judiciously disposed of once for all. And that leads him to say, as he is, so are we in this world. Having looked at the result of divine love, we may notice further that the effect of his love in this present becomes the cause of our boldness in the future. For we read that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So, or I should say, as he is, so are we in this world. Well, who would have the temerity to rely upon boldness in the day of judgment just because of his practical state now? But when it's seen that our positive standing before God, that eternal favor in which we are in Christ, is such that God makes no difference between the Son and the many sons, but declares that while we are down here in this world, we are before him as Christ in glory. Though not a particle of that glory is yet ours, what solid comfort, what established peace we have, who have believed even in view of that tremendous day. Now this word, boldness, is met with in two other places in the epistles, but uniformly ha as the effect of God's activity in his love toward us, and not as a result of any attainment of ours. In the first of these is Ephesians 11 and 12, and it tells us that it is according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. In the other, Hebrews 10 verses 19 and 20, it is the direct effect of the blood of Christ. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, and so on. Therefore, his eternal purpose in Christ Jesus, when he first brought me to himself, actually gave me the boldness through faith that we are told of in his word in coming to him. This is an entirely changed standing. The efficacy of the blood, the new and the living way, opened, and the presence of God's high priest affords to my soul the boldness of a worshiper in entering through the rent or torn veil into that holiest of all. There is nothing short of the very place where he dwells. Okay? In other words, it's an entirely new place for me to be allowed in. If my standing is in the same acceptance, or is, is the same acceptance as the acceptance of what Jesus Christ is before God, and his very place is mine, given to me now by faith, then surely we may not, nah, no, must not, refuse the sequence of this process in God's eternity. That boldness, even still again in the day of judgment, for God's word tells us that he that feareth is not made perfect in love, May the grace that has set us in such brilliantly clear divine favor deepen in our souls, so completely full and happy, so overwhelmingly in the sense of it, that this, his love for us, and with us, being made perfect, that we also may be made perfect in it. Satisfied with thee, satisfied with thee, Lord, Jesus, I am blessed. Peace which passeth understanding on thy breast. No more doubting, no more trembling, oh, what rest. Occupied with me, Lord Jesus, in thy grace, all thy ways and thoughts about me only trace deeper stories of the glories of thy grace. Taken up with thee, Lord Jesus, I would be finding joy and satisfaction all in thee, thou the nearest and the dearest unto me. Listening for thy shout, Lord Jesus, in the air, when thy saints shall rise with joy to meet thee there, Oh, what gladness, no more sadness, sin nor care. Longing for the bride, Lord Jesus of thy heart, to be with thee in the glory where thou art. Love so groundless, grace so boundless, wins my heart. When thy blood-bought church, Lord Jesus, is complete, when each soul is safely landed at thy feet, what a story in the glory she'll repeat. Oh, to praise thee there, Lord Jesus, evermore. Oh, to grieve and wander from thee nevermore. Earth's sad story closed in glory on yon shore. Then thy church will be, Lord Jesus, the display of thy richest grace and kindness in that day, making pages wondrous stages o'er the earth's way. Now it would seem from John 5 that the shout, the shout is for the dead and not for the living. And remember, folks, if you're born again, you've already passed away, and you are already in heaven. That's why... <laughs> 1 John 4.17 tells us that as Jesus is, so am I in this world. 
Meditate on that scripture until you become it. God bless you. Well, welcome back from that little break. panel this afternoon uh, where we discuss the questions and comments and issues of our messages if you have questions or comments you can feel free to send them to us at poet at cox.net that's poet at cox.net and we'll address them on tomorrow's panel we didn't get any last night so I'm not going to be talking to you about them today but we are going to go forward I'm your moderator Dr. Stephanie um, uh, Tiffany you want to open us in prayer yes I'm happy to do that <clears throat> Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and thank you much for all the wonderful messages that were today. They were full of great stuff, just really great stuff. And I thank you now that only those words as we enter into this panel discussion that you would have come from us are spoken from our mouth. All of you, Father, and none of us, 
all of you, Lord, and none of me. We give you honor, praise, and glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Um, um, our, our topic for today is Chosen in Christ. And I want to welcome um, uh, Tiffany Whittington to our panel today. Tiffany has been founder and operator of a ministry of for feeding the homeless. She is a cancer survivor, not because of medical technology, but because of that. And she believes that Jesus did it for her at the cross. And, uh, and that was accomplished for her before the foundation of the world. And I agree with her. Tiffany counsels other cancer patients and shares with them the hope of that God's grace provides. And she shares the word of God with great insights and understanding. Now, uh, Tiff is, ex is a professional costumer, teaching and manufacturing her own designs, royal rags, and teaches under her business, sewing, uh, So Creative, I'm sorry, So Creative. Tiffany is definitely using the talents and giftings that God has given her to spread the word of God and display Christ in her life. And we are blessed to have her with us in this 2015 e-crusade. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. Now, today, uh, it's going to be my sister and I, Tiffany, is my sister, and so we're both going to be talking to you about Chosen in Christ. Um, John 15, verse 16 tells us, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Then Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says, Having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 2.10 tells us this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So the first question I have for us today is, What do you think is meant by us being chosen by God, and why do you suppose that God chose us? <laughs> That's probably the second most controversial question in the entire world. <laughs> <clears throat> especially in the Christian world or mm -hmm. in the minds of those who are borderline or even Christians who have who are going through fire mm -hmm. trying to figure out okay God if your word says that you chose me then why do I have to go through all of this because you already know what the outcome is so what do I have to walk through this fire for there were some outstanding things said today uh, one of them that you almost ended with a few minutes ago was that what we're seeing really is a false view of reality mm -hmm. and that our view is only half of what the truth is. We just don't have a concept of what you're saying. I mean, I hear you and we understand the words, but until things are revealed and that veil is lifted from you, you just don't get it. And that's an individual quest. Yes. I mean, that's it an takes individual time. walk. Sometimes you don't mm -hmm. get it until, you know, a long time goes by. So I kind of like to stand on um, two things. If you read the entire book of Ephesians, a lot of things will become clear. That's true. You're going to have to read it 50 times before you get any of it really good. Mm -hmm. But some of the stuff will become more clear to you as the more you do it, like anything. You have to practice. You have to practice the Bible. Yeah. You can't just take it and figure that you got it because you won't. And the other one is from Second Corinthians, um, Corinthians one verse twenty four that for by faith you stand. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, and Karen's message today was really that. Mm -hmm. You have to have faith, and here's how you get it. Yeah. And once you get it, even though you only have a teeny tiny bit of it, you just stand there and wait. The whole process really is blind faith. Yeah. And your question about what do you think is meant by us being chosen by God and what do we suppose and why do you suppose that God uh, chose us is a blind faith issue for me. She made one really profound, oh, well, she made a lot of profound statements, but the one that really yeah. smacked me was, because God, you said it, and I believe it. Mm -hmm. So, again, all of the questions through this entire e crusade keep smacking of who do you believe, what do you believe? <laughs> do you believe God mm -hmm. or not? If you do, then it's blind faith mm -hmm. because some of it's a mystery. Most of it is. Even as little bits or tidbits are revealed, 
none of it is going to be totally revealed until we get to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. But it would be nice if you'd tell me some along the way. He is. And he does. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to fathom it completely, because we are human and we only have a small speck of rational thinking, mm -hmm. it is exactly, you said it, God, and I believe it. Well, Whether I get it or not is irrelevant. I believe it because I want to. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was interrupting you. Uh, there, there's a colloquialism that that runs through the Christian community that uh, God said it, that settles it. Yeah. You well. know, and and that's your blind faith that you're talking about. Yeah, that settles it. I don't care what I want to believe or what I don't. If I vacillate in my belief, unbelief, wibbly wobbly, <laughs> you know, wishy washy, whatever. Bottom line is, God said it, that settles it. It's done. It's a done deal. Yeah, so why fight it? Just accept it and then try to grow mm -hmm. in how to use it exactly. rather than is it real or not. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you could argue that point forever. There's people who will argue yes and people who will argue no and people who will argue down the middle sometimes and sometimes not. I really don't care. He said it, I believe it. Mm -hmm. And I think what Karen said was exactly on right on it, right mm -hmm. there. You said it, Lord. I don't understand it. Maybe I don't agree, but I believe what you say is true. Mm -hmm. Everything else is negative. Therefore, I'm moving forward with that. So, to answer that question, did God create us? Are we chosen? Yes. We're chosen because he created us. It's clear as a bell. He said it, and that's mm -hmm. it. That's right. I made you. I chose you. He chose me, and I have to put that into a personal concept. So, mm -hmm. If you all could just do that, instead of making it collective, instead go to, what do I believe? I, inside me, in my head, in my heart. Do I understand it? No. Mm -hmm. I don't profess to understand it. I don't care whether I really understand it. Because if I did, I'd probably not be here. I'd be in heaven, and I really would like to be here a little bit longer. i got things I want to do and see and experience yet. So, yes... He chose us. There is no question about that. All the scriptures from Ephesians repeat that over and over mm -hmm. and over. And I could go back and quote every one of them, but just read that book mm -hmm. because they're all in there. Yeah. And there's no questioning it. It's clear. So the second part was, why do I suppose that he chose me? <laughs> well, this is a real good one. Um, I think he chose me because he is wonderful, he is awesome, he has a sense of humor and compassion and love, and he wanted a companionship with those of us that he created. He wanted some fun and some joy, and he wanted us to do whatever he asked us to blindly, and he wanted us to share how wonderful that feeling is and how wonderful he is with everybody. So, there you have the answer to my thought. Okay, well, God chose me because he loves me. God is love and he created me in love and out of love and he loves me and I was thought of by him in his mind before the foundation of the world and therefore I am. And that's the way I feel about it. I mean, there is no other way to look at it because I believe what I believe. And it's what do you believe? I believe that God chose me. He thought of me. Because God speaks and everything that God does is in the past tense. You see. Um, and when you read the word of God, everything that he did is in the past tense because he is perfect. And he can't think it and speak it that it doesn't happen. Take Genesis, for example. He spoke it. It came in, to him in his mind. It was already past tense. It was easy to create. He spoke it out loud. And then he looked and saw what he said. And he said it was good. Of course, it was going to be good. He is perfect and wonderful. So uh, everything that God does and says is past tense. Therefore, before the foundation of the world, when he said to, God, to Jesus, and they were talking about us with the Holy Spirit, and he said, let us make man in our image, he saw me. And therefore, I am. Because he thought of me, and all he had to do was manifest me however he does. Whether he spoke it, he breathed his breath into me, 
created my body and, and my mother's womb and breathed his breath of life in me. I operate on his breath, and I'll tell you what a rude awakening that was for me when I realized through the Holy Spirit showing me that our breath is still, that we breathe right now, the, it's like uh, when you start an engine and you, that won't start and they go with that machine, that stuff, ether or whatever it is, and then it starts right up, that real quick. Well, that was like the way he did us. He kick-started us and gave us his breath. Now we're breathing his breath. Just because we exhale doesn't mean his breath goes away. Our life is sustained on that breath. And, and when I realized that everything that we say, all the words that we speak, everything that we do and, and say... Uh, collectively, good, bad, or indifferent, are all on his breath. And it's all so, history the minute he opens his mouth. Oh, absolutely. And so, but here's the thing. We curse. We defame. We gossip. You know what I mean? We backbite and, and stuff like that. And we're doing that on God's breath. I mean, that really shook me to my core. <laughs> I went, oh, wait, forgive me. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a bit scary. <laughs> you know. So, but when you become, <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit was showing me that, I, I guess because I was guilty, I don't know, but <clears throat> because I really needed to know it. But here we sit, and I thought to myself, man. So I started changing things because I, I thought, that, ooh, how awful. I'm not glorifying God, you see. Yeah. And so to me, anything mm -hmm. and everything that we do uh, has to give God glory because we are His glory. We are his creation. So our job here then is to glorify him with everything that he has gifted us with, everything that he has given us as a gift, which likes our breath, our life, and all that we can do and say. And it all boils down to we will walk successfully in the word of God, we'll walk successfully in his will, if we live by what do we believe. It, you have, you know? Exactly. It always comes back to that same sentence. Because if I don't believe what God says, what his word says about him being everything done in the past tense, then I'm going to think uh, wrong thoughts. I'm going to change things, and it's going to misconstrue all of the scriptures. And uh, we get, that's what, what happens. We get our scriptures out of context because we don't read the Bible right. We don't look at what's being said and, and who's saying it and what they're saying it about or to. We don't look at the culture that they lived in and how to apply it to today's culture, even though everything in God's word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that, that wouldn't make any difference. But remember, he has a bird's eye view. He's up here in the heavens, the third heaven, and he's looking down on us. Now, when we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we too are at the right hand of the Father. We're not at the right hand of Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father. We're in Christ. So we are part and parcel of that entity there because he's the Son of Man and He has uh, he's in us and we're in him. Now, we see things the same way he does if we see ourselves there. And we start looking at the situations around us that life deals out, all the dirt and all the rubble and whatnot. Uh, we will see it from God's perspective. God sees it like you go to Disneyland and you see the you sit down in the bleachers and the parade comes by and we see it in a linear, linear, linear well, however you say it, you know. Uh, panel by panel. Uh, each float that comes by, we look and we see it, and then we look down, we see it's coming, and then it gets in front of us, and we look as it goes away, but it's right there, and it's only in front of us when we actually see it, really get the full view of it. God doesn't. We don't see the end from the beginning. He does. He sees the whole thing from the beginning to the end, and from the end to the beginning, the whole picture. When we're in Christ and we realize that we too have that privilege, we have that ability to see from that perspective. We just need to learn how to do it, and we do it from the spiritual realm. Um, some of us get scared and go, oh, forget that, I'm not doing that. I don't know how to do that. I don't want anything to do with this, the spirit realm because it's spooky. Yeah, but yet you'll sit down and watch every scary show on TV <laughs> because they like being afraid, you know. So anyway, it's what do you believe, and that's basically right. You exactly encapsulated it from the very beginning. What do you believe? Um, any further comments on that? Well, the last part of the question, which I I didn't cover, was um, did he choose... Well, I haven't given you oh, that. I thought you did. I'm no, sorry. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. I only went through, suppose, uh, why do you suppose that God chose us? Uh, did he choose all of us or only some of us? And if some, why and to what end? What are your thoughts on that? I think he chose all of us. If he created all of us, then he had to have chosen us in the first place. Period. There's, there isn't any doubt in my mind about that. 
Um, why did he choose? Why does it appear that he chose some of us because people turn their back on what he says? Mm -hmm. I haven't in my own mind ever come to total grips with the whole thought process of why some bad things happen. I mean, I know it's the devil. I know that. But it's really hard to get up every day and go, how come? Why did this happen? Did I do it to myself because I said something somewhere? Did I open the door somewhere so the devil could come in there and get me? I personally believe that when he chooses us, he chooses us to have all the blessings and the good stuff. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get it, it's our own fault. I don't like to think it's my fault, but I know that it has to be because he doesn't do bad stuff. He allows things that we have made choices, bad choices on to come to fruition, but he'll always hold your hand through it and you'll come out on the other side better than before you went in. I don't, I don't always like that thought. I don't like having to go through it. And when he knew it all in the first place, why did he make me do it? Every time I ask that question, I get the same answer from every person that I ask it. Because you have nothing to compare it to. If it we're all good, how do you know what bad is? And there's no way to compare, you know, what's, what's right and what's wrong if there's nothing wrong. So, do I get that? Well, I comprehend the English language. Do I get it? No. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't care whether I get it. I mean, <laughs> when I get into a deep... I don't. When I get into deep conversation about it, and the, you know, the answer is never really there because it's always going to be slightly covered or it's going to be opinionated by a person. So I have to go back to what do I believe? Do I believe God? Yes. Mm -hmm. He said it. Okay. I'm not going to fight that anymore. It's just, okay, I don't care. I'll keep going. Mm -hmm. I'll keep going because it's the only way sometimes a person can survive some of the stuff. All right, Lord, I know you're out there. I know you chose me. I know I have accepted you. I know in my heart who Jesus is, who you are, who the Holy Spirit is, and I want that in me. I have it in me now because I've accepted that. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to heaven. I'll just walk through this water, however deep it gets, and know that the rowboat's on the other side and you're going to take me home. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes that's the only focus I can have because crud happens to you. <laughs> uh, you know, I went through the stuff with uh, illness, mm -hmm. fatal almost illness, and I did. I really struggled for two or three weeks with how did this happen to me when when I believe in faith healing. How did I ever get in this boat? How did it get on me when I, I believe bad stuff like that is from the devil and not from God? So I finally had to just go, I don't care how it got here. I believe that you're going to take me through it, and the end result mm -hmm. is what I want, not what I have to go through to get to the end result. It would be really great if there was nothing to have to go through, but... Um, that's only because I know the difference between right and wrong and good and bad now. If I had never experienced it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get it. it. And that's, I believe, what he wants us to do because in having us go through stuff and come out on the other side is standing in that blind faith space. No matter what, you cannot take that away from me. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't care what anybody says. You'll never change my mind. Period. You will not change my mind. That is the stronghold of a good having, <laughs> yeah, a good of having Jesus and knowing God. Mm -hmm. Is that in the end, even if the earth suit bombs out and you go through a bunch of crud in the end, when you walk over the other side, everything is different mm -hmm. and it's wonderful. So you hang on to that thought process because that's all well, there is. There isn't anything. If I didn't have that, or even the hope of that, then what's the point? Well, yeah, it's the hope. It's the hope. You know? And of then it's being what true. you believe. If you want to believe it. And it's yeah. a, is what you want to. Is your want to big enough? If it isn't, then you won't receive Jesus. You know, what do you believe? It's what you receive. You open yourself and position yourself to receive the the blessings of God by positioning yourself in Christ 
and knowing then that all the promises are really yours. You might not get them all in one lump because you have to learn how to walk and talk. And, you got to follow know. the rules. Yeah. And the book gives you the rules and you argue with the rules mm -hmm. and then the devil comes along and helps your argument and clobbers you <laughs> because you don't want to do that yeah. when you're used to something else mm -hmm. and it's foreign and strange to you so you don't follow the rule or you make a bad choice mm -hmm. that sort of follows the top of the fence but not really and the rule. And then you rationalize your choice. Yes, and then <laughs> you fall off the fence and mm -hmm. stub your toe and you get up and you go, all right, I got it. Then you get up and go again and you go through the same stinking thing. Maybe because you didn't times, get it all. Because you didn't get it all right. Mm -hmm. You got part of it. Well, and I think that that's, that's the, and that is, and to what end is the choice? Mm -hmm. He's watching us go through the process. We've made our choice. Sometimes we make sloppy choice. Not always bad, but sloppy. But he never leaves you there. That part, thank goodness, thank God for that, because you'll always come out on the other side. And, you know, if the water gets up to your neck, you'll learn how to swim real quick. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Because you'll do he's going to hold takes. you there. You'll do whatever it takes to get you to the other side. And if you don't follow those rules, you're going to fall off the fence. So... Yeah, he chooses, he chooses all of us. If we choose to follow him because he gave us that choice mm -hmm. and he wanted us to have that choice so that we could show him that we love him, then you just follow the rules as closely as you can. You know, I don't think any of us are totally perfect. We're supposed to think we are because we have Jesus in us, but I'm still working on that part. And, um, well... The, bur the Word of God tells us that we face these challenges because Jesus suffered and we're supposed to suffer with Christ. We are in his, made in His image and His likeness. Mm -hmm. So the bad things that happen to us, uh, if you want to call them those bad things, a lot of them we bring on ourselves. Um, but they are there and designed. The Word of God says we will have trials and tribulations. It tells you you're going to have them. So, knowing that we're going to have trials and tribulations, we don't get to pick and choose which ones come along. Right. <laughs> it's how we respond that we're judged. Now, all of the punishment for our sin and broken covenant and everything that we did wrong, past, present, future, were all uh, taken by Jesus on the cross. So that we were judged, our judgment that, that as a born-again believer, we don't go to the judgment of the white, great, great white throne judgment because that's where you get the, the punishment. We don't get punished. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. We accepted him as Lord and Savior. And this is the part that, that is the thing. Most people that are born again accept him as Savior, but not don't make him Lord of their life. And because he's not Lord of their life, they end up in more trials and more tribulations and they seem to have all the bad things happen to good people and they just wonder why that happens to them all the time because they haven't made him lord of their life maybe he's lord in this area but not in this one you know we are designed to grow in christ spiritually we were designed in a body we were babies we grew up in, and the body got great big what if the spirit stayed the size of a pea you know i mean that's what we're looking at so People grow, and some people are teenagers, some of them are babies, some of them are, you know, 10-year-olds or whatever in the spirit. Because our spirit is designed to grow also. Because our spirit is supposed to actually grow bigger than our body so that we become more and more Christ-like, that we become Christ. We are actually the only Christ that anybody, as born-again believers, we're the only Jesus Christ that anybody's going to see here on this earth. It's physical. So if Hopefully. we're not responding in a proper way to the things that that God has set down then that settles it you know if we're not doing that we're going to go through trials and tribulations it's like having to you go find yourself in the same situation over and over again whoops I made a mistake and I'm going back around the mountain for another 40 years you know those people went 11 miles <laughs> yeah. and it took them 40 years and not one of them not one of them of the of the original for uh, Israelites over. went mm -hmm. into Canaan, the land of promise. Not one of them made it. They died in the wilderness because they didn't get it. We keep 
going, it's like, it's like Groundhog Day, the movie. We get up and we go through the same thing over again. And we get up and go, and we, but we never learn. The first 50 times we go through it, it's a, well, here we are again, and oh dear, and oh dear. And then like the guy in the movie, we start saying, well, wait a minute, I can change this. I can change this. And that's a, a very silly way to look at it, but I mean, it's basically it's the same thing. What do you understand? The Word of God says that uh, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So that tells me, and this told me a long time ago, well, I got it. That tells me that no matter what the Word of God says, the wisdom of God is in that Word, and I'm supposed to get that, and the only way to, to deal with it and operate in that wisdom when I do get it is to have understanding of it. So I looked at the Word of God and I said, I don't understand any of this. I don't understand it when I read it, and I slammed the book shut, put it down, and I said, I'm sick and tired of reading this and not getting anything out of it. I'm not saying that it was a foreign language, but I mean, it might as well have been when it was. It went from mm -hmm. it reading a book and you comprehend you. the story, and then reading the, the book and not getting the parable because you don't get it, you know. So I said, Lord, if you are God, and what your word says is true, and you're bringing me promises, and I'm supposed to be made in your image and likeness, then... I want to be able to read this Bible and have everything come to life for me just like it was a play and I was in it and it was going on around me and in panorama and I could see it and I would become part of the story and feel how it happens and you know what I put that Bible down and it probably I'm gonna say about three or four days I picked it back up again I thought well I'll try again I don't even remember what I opened up but I think it was uh, where uh, Elisha um, I uh, said to, to the prayer about the kid that was with him, the, the servant, and he said, open his eyes so he could see, and he saw all the chariots of fire and all the mm -hmm. angel, angelic hosts. Okay, I believe that was the story, and it was exactly that. I mean, it was, I, I was there. And it came to, and every time I read the word, that's what happens. It looms out on the page of me, and I can actually, it, it just actually becomes the whole story is alive. I asked for it, and God knew that I needed that for understanding, and when I asked for it, He gave it to me. So, part of the thing that we go through, too, is that, uh, which is the complete Holy Spirit trail, as Sherry calls it, um, is that um, we, it's what we ask for. You know, Jesus says many times in the Bible, and especially in this one particular area, which I was talking about today, that um, ask... You haven't asked anything in my name up until now, but ask, and, I, and my Father in who is in heaven will give it to you. All right. Uh, we don't ask correctly. We ask amiss. You know? First of all, we ask for the wrong thing. We ask for the thing that is uh, stupid for us to have. I mean, something we don't really need. Like another mirror. <laughs> you know, or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, but stuff that we really don't need. Actually... We should be, when we pray for things, we shouldn't be airing our laundry list. Because as born-again believers, if we're born again now, as born-again believers, God already, the Word of God says He already knows what you need. He knows everything you need. He knows everything about you. So we go in there and we get on our knees and we say, Lord, I need blah, 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 blah. I need blah, 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 blah. And what happens? Nothing. He already knows. He says, why are you telling me that? Why aren't you praying about other people and their needs. Why aren't you know these sick people that ask you to pray for them? Why aren't you praying for them? You know, and, and when when we look at the outline of the Lord's Prayer, it says, "Our Father who art in heaven." It starts with "Our Father." Well, when we come to Him and say, "Lord, I need," He says, "Where's everybody else?" You know, we're to bring other people's petitions. When we pray for others, that's part of intercessory prayer. When we pray for others and their needs, our needs are automatically met. And if we have our focus properly on God being our only source, and He is our source of supply, we will look to Him, not the Bank of America, not to our job, not to our government checks or whatever. We will look to Him for our source of, of uh, supply. And He'll supply the need more than enough. And He says, you know what? I want you to give me 10% of your increase. Not income, increase. <laughs> and so... Our income is part of our increase, and um, and that is to teach us a discipline. All right, so we we do that, and he does listen. He does that so that he can bless the rest. If you'll give him ten percent, one tenth, he will stretch the rest of it to beyond measure. 
so that you have more than enough because God is a God of more than enough. And when you run down to the right, right down to the wire and you think, I don't know how much money, I don't have any money and we've got all this rest of the month left and what am I going to do? And, you know, we don't enter his rest. We start taking it on ourselves. Jesus is no longer our Lord. We're Lord over our own stuff. So we have to say, well, wait a minute. I'm going to enter God's rest. You know what? I'm putting pressure on my covenant. My covenant says that God will meet my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus, therefore, bring it on. You're, I want you to bring it on. I need these things. You know what my needs are. I don't even have to ask because I know it will be taken care of. And what happens? I, get, I go into his rest because it's all on him. It's like if you have a, your parents at home and you're still a kid living at home and you've got a part-time job and you want to buy something in your jet paychecks and won't cover it so you go to your mom or your dad or both of them and you say well I need XYZ dollars to make the difference up and uh, will you give it to me and you know in your heart of hearts they're going to do it because they love you and it's not something that's outrageous you know it's not like a mink coat <laughs> you know or something you don't need and they say well you didn't even have to ask because we would have gotten you that you know because we love you same kind of thing but we looked at that point they were our source because we were little kids and we just I mean dinner just happened breakfast just happened but really it wasn't daddy happened that made it happen it was God daddy God that made it happen and uh, and I'm out there on a rabbit trail so yeah but at the same time it does say in there that you're supposed to ask well you and don't have to ask for food you whatever you ask for you'll get. Well, I, I'm going to give you an example of okay. where I'm at. Uh, for many years I lived in the woods of Northern California working for the California Department of Forestry in a campground, in several campgrounds, but there were, <clears throat> in the winter time, they were free campgrounds and we were filling up with people all the time. Uh, people who lost their house, mothers and dads with their children who were going to live in a tent and somehow they always ended up on my doorstep and they didn't have any food mm -hmm. and they didn't know where they were going to get it, they didn't, couldn't get a job or the job they had was at McDonald's and it only was four days a week and it wasn't enough money to buy gas to get back and forth to town let alone feed them all the time and this is a true this is a very true story and it's still like a miracle to me every time I think about it but um, I only had so much food in my space and I shared it mm -hmm. because I children have to eat and this man was um, got a job he had three children they lived in their tent he and his wife and the three kids and he he got this job at at Burger King and Burger King's policy was then now we're talking 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Anything they didn't use that day, they had to throw away. Mm -hmm. They couldn't, they had to get rid of it. They couldn't use it the next day. Right. So now if you think about that, okay, I bought this package of hot dog buns. If I don't eat all six of them or eight of them today, I have to get rid of it and get a different one, a brand new one tomorrow. So he started coming back to the campground with boxes of hamburger buns mm -hmm. that they had to get rid of. <laughs> yeah. And he shared them with everybody in the campground. Mm -hmm. We made um, breadcrumbs. We fed the birds. We did everything we could with them. Well, it got a, it was a really bad winter and it rained 36 days in a row. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean sprinkled. I'm talking rain, pouring mm -hmm. down rain. People didn't have any food. We couldn't get out of the campground to get to the store. Uh -huh. And I hiked 13 miles a day to do the rounds of the campgrounds. I didn't have anything. I had maybe three potatoes, and I, and I don't think it was more than that, but three potatoes will not feed 35 people. Mm -mm. <laughs> and um, maybe an onion and whatever I could forage out of the woods. So I started on my rounds, and when I left, I said, you know, Lord, you said ask anything in your name and you'll do it. Now, I don't have, I don't go to church all the time. I don't this, I don't that, and I la la la. But I have all these people here that I don't know how they're going to eat. Mm -hmm. 
three potatoes in my store won't give me enough to feed any of them in my in my cupboard. The cupboard. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you will. But I need your help. In the name of Jesus, of course. Of course. So I went on about my rounds. And when I came back to my site, there were three sacks of groceries on my front porch. No note. I don't, to this day, 20 years later, I don't know where those groceries came from. Yes, you do. <laughs> I never told another living soul mm -hmm. that I didn't have enough food to feed those people. I only told God. I still, yeah, they fell out of the sky in a bag. There was meat, there was canned stuff, there was enough food to carry us through the rest of the rain until that 36 mm -hmm. days. People came to my front door and knocked on it with their bowl, and I just gave yeah. them food. Cooked, I cooked it yeah. all, but I gave it to them. Here, feed the kids, and they'd bring the kids over, and when the rain would stop enough, we could have a campfire outside. We would have a campfire outside, and they would sit there, and they'd eat until they were full. The bag never ran empty. I never ran out of anything. Mm -hmm. I, and, I mean, talk about miracle. It just... It, That's loaves and fishes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's loaves and, and fishes. But I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to deserve that. You prayed. But when you're talking about praying for somebody else's stuff, exactly. I wasn't... But I never even thought about it. No, of course not. It was just but that's that's the way you're supposed to be, not thinking about it. It just first nature. It just happened, and I can't say that I'm always like that. But that instance um, will never well, go away. I can away. say that you're always like that. You're my sister, and I'm around you, so I know <laughs> there are times when you're not, and you have other issues. <laughs> I see. But that's not one of them. <laughs> well, I just have to say, mm -hmm. in truth, if you stop thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I had three potatoes. I could live on three potatoes for 36 days. I, you know, I'll figure out a way. Mm -hmm. And I knew how to forage in the woods, and I knew what kind of stuff you could eat that was in the woods, so I could get by. Mm -hmm. But I could not have ever fed that many people on what I had. I understand. And uh, if a person, all of you sitting out there listening to this, will get off of your own agenda and start putting the other people's agenda first. And you can always come back to it in the end, Lord, you know what I need. Mm -hmm. And it has to be here by 5 o'clock Tuesday night so I can pay my rent Monday mo or Wednesday morning. Uh, thank you for it. George Mueller uh, used mm -hmm. to run an orphanage, and you know he, mm -hmm. who I'm talking about. And he, um, he had a whole orphanage full of kids. They'd go to church on Sunday, and people would say, here, let me give you some money. No, no, no. It was like charity, and we didn't want to take charity. He said, nope, the Lord takes care of us. And they would get it around the table. There was no food at all in the house. They'd sit down, change their clothes after church, and go sit down around the table, hold hands, and pray, and thank God. They would thank Him for the provision, and somebody would knock on the door, and they would open the door, and here's bags of groceries, or a turkey cooked, or something like that. And they always ate every meal. Every single meal was done that way. And in a way, now people think, oh, that's extreme. He could have taken the money and bought groceries and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he could have, but you know what? He was living that principle. Yes. He lived it out and said, I'm putting pressure on my covenant, Lord. You said, these are my wards, these are your wards, and they need to grow up and know that they can do that too. You know? Yes. So, and mm -hmm. because he chooses everybody, there isn't one that is created that he didn't choose. That's absolutely right. Then it is our job to study it, under, try to understand it, mm -hmm. and when you don't, ask him to give you understanding or put you in the direction you need to be, and he will open the door every time. But I want you to understand something, too, because I need to say this. He didn't choose us um, already in Christ. No. He chose us that we would become in Christ, that we would make the right choice, because he gave us a free will for a reason, that we would make those right choices. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want, to, want people to understand that. But we were chosen to make a choice. Yes. And we were chosen because he thought of us and loved us in the first place enough to make us. So these people who curse God for their existence, you know, uh, they have to think twice about that. Well, it gets awful hot sometimes. <laughs>
Oh, well, it's going to get a lot higher in that lake of fire. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, uh, Ephesians 1, 4 says that according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, how should we respond to the incredible grace expressed here? Well, first you have to have a good understanding of grace, which is in the dictionary there's three different actual definitions, but they seem to point out one that that they use as a Christian definition, and in reality it's a definition period, period. It's unmade, unmerited favor mm-hmm. of God. So, since all of us are given that mustard seed of faith and the hope he calls us immediately with that little mustard seed of faith everybody knows there is something bigger I don't care whether you want to stand there and tell me you don't Mm -hmm. you do and you can deny it all you want when the time comes you'll reach there you'll reach there Mm -hmm. so that part's fine I mean, if they want to say that they were a seed of amoeba floating around in the ocean and crawled out on the sand, fine, but who put them in the amoeba in the first place? Right. <laughs> different, different doctrines um, say different things. There are people that I feel are completely heathen, don't believe in God. They don't believe in the God I believe in. In truth, the name on that God is not the same. Because it isn't the same God. They have put a man person in that space instead of leaving the deity of God there. They've taken other things out of the Bible and applied them, bent the words a little, some they didn't bend at all. Some of the principles stayed the same, but the God person didn't. Changed. Mm-hmm. That changed. Because of that and because he said don't do that, they're going to pay the price and they're going to try to force us to pay the price too. Mm-hmm. And for all their forcing, it doesn't much matter once you've bought your ticket and you know that you know that you know that, even if you know nothing else, that little bit of mustard seed faith will come to fruition and will grow into the tree (laughs) Mm -hmm. and all of that unmerited favor will come out. The end result, of course, is eternity in heaven with God with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, in a spiritual sense. Mm-hmm. And I guess it doesn't ma- It doesn't matter enough whether you understand whether you're going to have a spirit body or come back with a real body. I don't care about any of that. All I want to do is see that face. Mm-hmm. Sit at that foot and know that what he said is true. Mm-hmm. So you have to go back to what do you believe. What do you want to believe? There you go. What do you want to believe? Do you want to believe that you're going to go to the wake of fire and burn there forever? No. I don't think there's any person standing, I don't care how bad he is, Mm -hmm. that wants to believe that. Even the terrorist groups that are so prevalent right now, who believe if they kill people, Mm -hmm. they're going to get these kind of rewards. If they put their reward into, or I'm going to go to the lake of fire, they'll change their mind real quick. Because the choice isn't what you want to do. It want, you want the good stuff. You don't want the crud. So, keeping in mind all the other stuff, if you just go down to, as is G, as Jesus, Jesus is. is, so am I. What do I believe? And what do I want to believe? You cannot go wrong because he will continue to help you grow. He will continue to stop bad things from happening to you so that you're not totally destroyed. Worse could be. So if you have some bad stuff along the way, okay, it could be worse. Mm -hmm. Just keep looking at it like that so that you can get through every day. And did he choose me? Yes. And am I glad? You bet. You know, I had a... I don't even know what you said that made me think of this, so I'm just going to say it because whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, I had a lady that came. Her brother brought her here for a healing service. She had a couple multiple things done wrong with her. and um, 
so I laid hands on her. I taught the Word of God to her and then laid hands on her with her permission and administered the healing power of God to her body. Uh, about six weeks went by and she, uh, he, he came by to see me and he said, and I had prayed for him and I laid hands on him for something and, and he was healed completely, the brother. And so he called, called me and came by and said he wanted to come by and talk to me. And he said, my sister wants to know if, if uh, she comes again, will you lay hands on her again? <laughs> I said, no, I won't. And he said, why not? And I said, because she already had the healing power of God uh, administered to her body. It's laying in there dormant. She has to stir it up. I gave her the, I I'd sent her home with the uh, scripture, healing scriptures. I sent her home with a disc with, and with the teaching and all, all the uh, summarized so that she could, you know, get it right off the bat. Um, and I said, she needs to look at that stuff I sent home with her. So I said, he said, well, she wants to see you. I said, she can come and see me. I'm happy to meet with her, but I'm not going to lay hands on her again because I don't have to. She already has had that administered to her, you know, and he said, okay, all right. So he brings her. <clears throat> when she came in, um, she's, we started talking, she said, and we started talking and she said, well, will you lay hands on me again? And I said, no. And she said, well, I'm not healed. And I said, yeah, well, healing is a process. It's not always instantaneous. I mean, it's it can be okay. fast. It just it, you know, there's a process going on. And she said, "Well, but I'm not. I, I'm better in this part of the things that were happening. These two things are better. Uh, um, matter of fact, I'm not even bothered by them anymore." But she said, "This one thing with her eyes. She said, I, it's still there." And I said, "Well, let me ask you this. Remember when you first came to me?" Yes. And I said before, but I laid hands on you, how, how you saw. Mm -hmm. I said, are you seeing better now than then? And she said, well, yes, I am. She said, I started to see better a little bit every day. And she said, but I'm still not healed. I said, healing's a process. And if you give, uh, thank God every day for the healing, it will manifest itself in totality. You know, but you don't need me to administer the healing power of God to you again through the laying on of hands. You don't need it. You have it inside. And just as, as uh, Paul told Timothy, stir it up. It depends on you stirring it up. And the bottom line is, do you believe that you were healed when I laid hands on you? Did that God <laughs> healed you? And yeah. she said, well, yes, I do. I said, then stick with what you believe. And just thank him for that healing. And every time you get a twinge or you have a spot in your eye that you can't see or a blind spot, thank you, Lord, that I have he I'm healed and whole and well, nothing broken, nothing missing, that my mind and my is the mind of Christ is bound to the mind of Christ, and that I see perfectly. I do not see men as trees. I <laughs> see perfectly mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. And I said, and you keep it up. And I said, because every time the devil assails you, you have to attack him with the word of God. That's your sword. Mm -hmm. And he will flee. But anyway, uh, she went off and she's healed. Her eyes got yeah. better and better. I mean, she's she still wears glasses, but she doesn't have the condition. You know, so praise the Lord. And it's not me that did the healing. It was God that did the healing. Yes, and it's yeah. understanding that you've got it. I, I, you, mm -hmm. I mean, symptoms are going to be there. You can get rid of them and they'll, the devil will stand on your shoulder and try to tell you that the twinge in your foot is what is the same thing you had before mm -hmm. because he wants to take your eyes off of the right stuff it's learning how to fight that and it could take you a lifetime to do it it, it well it, it takes an everyday occurrence I mean every day you fight the fight uh, people say to me well I, I do spiritual warfare and I said you know what when you get up in the morning you're doing spiritual <laughs> warfare you got up you're a, a child of God you know so you're just getting up and fighting the good fight is spiritual warfare. So, not that they can't do spiritual warfare. I don't care about that. I'm just saying that some people think it's really important and it's the most mandatory thing over everything else. So, um, anyway. All right. So, that's we didn't answer the question. According to his, as Ephesians 1 says, that according as he hath chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So how should we respond to the incredible grace expressed here? How should we respond to that? With thanksgiving. Absolutely. Period. With thanksgiving. 
There, you know something, somebody asked me once, doesn't God get tired of you saying thank you? Probably not. Because we as human beings begin to think that it doesn't mean anything. If we say, I love you, and I love you, I love you, and, I love you, and people say, oh, that word, it means, word, word doesn't mean anything anymore because everybody says it all the time. It's, oh, I love that, I love this, I love that. And so, you know, doesn't God get kind of sick of hearing that? And no. I said, God never gets sick of hearing that. A parent never gets sick of hearing their child say, I love you. You know, and he is our parent. And um, he, I mean, he, he is, <laughs> the fact that we even have a, an opportunity to be in Christ, an opportunity to make the right decision. And, um, and once we're in Christ, that we're included in his plan for the moves that he's mm -hmm. making. Mm -hmm. Oh, what an honor. That, I mean, it makes you humble. It makes you well, humble because you think, little old me. Well, even if you don't think that, even if you don't think that, it should make you completely aware of the magnitude that he is. Oh my, huge! That there is, I mean, the the immenseness of the whole thing uh -huh. um, is just amazing. I I just went to, I just got back from a trip to uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, which is. Uh, a historical, a, a very historical town of when we went through the American Revolution and some things prior to it when we had um, the establishment of our of the people on the continent of America. And that whole area is the Bible Belt of America. And it is a gorgeous place. But when you sit and walk on ground that George Washington sat and walked on, that the first 144 people that came from Britain sailed to, tied their ship up to a tree and rowed a boat ashore and sat there. What I saw the most of, I spent a lot of time crying over the <laughs> blood that was shed there and the uh -huh. people and the sacrifices they made. But what I really saw that upset me more than anything else was their belief in God. You know, I know that the king fled, uh, you know, and wanted to move and change from, and the church was split from Catholicism to Protestant and all of that, but they still maintained the same God. <laughs> so those people... Every, every corner, everything you saw there had something to do with God. They said it. They weren't afraid to say, you know, God brought us here. God did this. He saved us from that and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. We have come so far uh, away from that when we were chosen to spread that. And talk about his aware, his awesomeness, and his wonder, and his grace and glory, from all the stories from the beginning of time to watching that. But as an American person sitting in their church, the church that they built, and they reproduced it when it was when it fell down. They put it back. They grew, They in 1902 they uh, built it again right on the same spot and you can see the original bricks underneath they have glass areas where you can see that foundation but on every wall there is something that is screaming God he put you here God he chose that 144 people to come over here because they had courage to stand up for him mm -hmm. and then when they got here they told the people the Indian people that were here already that had migrated from wherever they came from about God and how it moved all the way across the country I, I mean I can't tell you how Im how impressive it is to see that God was such a big thing and in the battles diminished him too now yes in the battles when they had gentlemanly battles where they lined up and okay we shoot and then now it's your turn you shoot and they all stood there knowing they were going to get hit by a bullet maybe and croak mm -hmm. it was all under God mm -hmm. I mean they used that whole umbrella it, it just amazes me to see how 
corrupt everything has been. I know. And, but it's part of the plan. And it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. That's for sure. Well, to answer this question, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without, without blame before him in love, we should be grateful for good works. Absolutely. We should... Uh, good works we do as well as good works others do. Absolutely. And to praise to the praise of his glory. We yes. need to praise his glory. For, the God, for God's good pleasure, that we should bring forth abiding fruit, that no flesh should glory in his presence, that we should be holy and without blame before him unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So that's the answer to that, really. It encompasses a lot of the things that we were yes. talking about. Now here's our second question. Paul tells us in Romans 8, verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So, if you are truly a child of God, this plan for you is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Why? To what end? What's the plan? Your thoughts, please. Why? Because he chose us in the first place. And he made us. He wrote the picture. He painted the picture. He thought it up in his head. And there's just no question. There's no, I mean, there's no other answer. Why to me is because he chose me. Thank you very much. And he said it. Thank you very much. Um, to what end? Mm -hmm. So that we would become the image of Jesus so that when we were all together in the spirit we be we are one family in the same um, going all in the same direction which is the direction God would have us be in I mean I'm not God so it's really hard to put I can only take things for what I comprehend mm -hmm. and the plan the plan is that we might each be filled with all the fullness of God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, that's my thought. Okay, so if you're truly a child of God, his plan for you is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's our mandate. That's what God destined us, predestined us to do. Because we... Are multiple Jesus <laughs> and, and can reach more people you know I mean we that yeah, yeah. Um, well they see and, Jesus through how we act and and why because Jesus is is Lord he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we are created to rule and reign with him we are supposed to be rulers and reigners ourselves and kings a royal priesthood to what end to that ruling and what's the plan that we would accomplish that and that we would rule and reign with Christ, and we would be the family of God, like you're talking about, and that we would be, um, be his. We would be his children. He would be our God, and we would be his people. Simple as that. But we're not going to get there if we don't accept Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. So, my friends, that's the end of the questions today. We're at half an hour early, but that's okay with me, and I hope it's okay with everybody else because it's really beastly hot. Mm. <laughs> and um, unless you want to talk some more about that last subject, no, I, you have I, no, okay. I, I mean everything I, everything I would ever have to say all comes in the same sentence. What do you believe? Who do you believe? And don't what do you want to believe? Mm -hmm. The well, what the, what they want to believe might get them in trouble. <laughs> but if they look at what they believe according to the scriptures, and I know that's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. according to what the Word of God says, um, God's infinite plan was to foil the devil. We're not pawns in a game. He gave us a free will so we could choose him. And he wants us to choose him. And for those of us that do, we glorify God. And our whole life is to be spent glorifying Him mm -hmm. with the glory gifts that He's given us, our talents, and our lifestyle. It's all about relationships, our relationship to God the Father our, through, through Jesus Christ, our relationship to the Son, Jesus Christ, our relationship to the Holy Spirit, 
is all part and parcel of of the test that we live in. We're we're tested and tried in by fire, you know, and we get all these ugly things that happen to us and yet how do we respond? How do we do we succeed in the test? We can succeed easily by knowing that we were chosen before the foundation of the world and that everything happened in the past tense. So mm. it's already been done before the foundation of the world. We were chosen and now when Jesus came and played it out here on the cross here for our benefit, we, we now see Christ revealed. We see the plan revealed. We see ourselves revealed. And... Um, oh. So we can we know how to enter his rest and and live there. The plan and everything is so simple. We make it hard. <laughs> we make it hard because we confuse the issue, and that's because the devil's in there with his mixed master, you know, scrambling eggs in our brain. But we've been given the mind of Christ. So if we just stop and say, you know what, Lord, what I want from you is what you want for me, you know. So you tell me what it is. You show me. Exactly. And he will always, always, I promise you, answer you, and you will get wisdom. And that's the principal thing. But unfortunately, even as born-again believers, so many of us are lazy. We don't want to le read the Bible. We don't want to look it up. We want to wait and sit in church on Sunday or watch TV and watch our, our uh, televangelists and let them tell us about it and tell us what to do. What if they're wrong? Would you know, because you didn't get in the Word, would you know if they were wrong? See, there's always the the what choice. Mm -hmm. This is, our life is a life of choices. You can get sick and choose to live or choose to die. Yeah. Yeah, make that, simple I mean, as that. Make it A or B. You cannot be sick, and you can make a choice to live forever, or die, and, and die in the lake of fire forever. Mm -hmm. You know? One of the things that I've always said is, you know, the Bible tells us that one way or the other, we live forever, for eternity, <laughs> either burning in hell or, or <laughs> for the good in heaven. And as born-again Christians, I find it very, uh, I guess I want to say earth-shattering, I don't know, no, we're shaking, when you stop and think about it, of... Uh, what do we have to offer people who are not born again, as born again Christians, what do we have to offer? What do we tell them about our life, our lifestyle, about Jesus in our life, that we can say is brings the Bible to life? You know what I mean? Yes, we have experienced these things that the Bible says. Um, well, what do we have to offer that makes our side look so good? No Nothing. fire. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing. But I mean... Nothing, really. I mean, with the way it is now, the way yeah, that everything yeah. has been downplayed, where nobody sees the way that the pulpit has been bringing the word of God to the, the the people, they go and they listen to tickle your eardrums, bend the thing around it to make you feel all right, and you can you can ra uh, rationale, you know, and you oh it's okay, uh, I, God understands. No, God doesn't under He does understand, but He doesn't like it. So, what do we have to offer? And I'm telling you that once we get a hold of who we are in Christ, the power that we have, which we haven't even begun during this uh, mm -hmm. crusade yet to talk about that, the power that we have as Christians and what to do with it and how to uh, uh, manifest it, we, I mean, we don't, we look at ourselves like, you know, 98 pound weakling on the beach, skinny and your rib cage shows, when that's not it at all. We're muscle bound, the incredible Hulk you know <laughs> spiritually if we exercise and like you said practice 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 we have to practice the word practice the bible practice all of it and it's a choice what do you believe what do you what do you believe and what do you want to believe well I want to believe i'm going to amend your want to believe i'm going to say what do you choose to believe okay because it's a choice it is a choice yes, yes. And it is want. It's like maybe they don't want to believe that that you know they've got a uh, hangnail, but <laughs> but you know what I mean. But mm -hmm. um, they can choose to not believe it. And remember this, folks: if you're sick in bed, those are lying symptoms, and they're brought to you by your friendly devil. You know, <laughs> you don't have to have them. 
choose to believe what God's Word says about you. You're healed. You were healed at the cross. Jesus did it for you there, so you didn't have to go through that. You are sick because you chose it and agreed with the enemy. Simple as that. So don't agree with him. We're not denying the, the, the symptoms. We're denying the right to be there because the devil has no power over you if you're a born-again believer. Well, that's all we have time for today. We're going to go ahead and close out because it's hot here and, um, and we're tired. <laughs> okay. So we'll see you all tomorrow. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us on the, the 2015 E-Crusade at all. I speak on behalf of all the staff when I say that we pray that you have received some valuable information that will be life-changing. Remember, too, that we have archived these meetings on themasterstouch.org, Facebook, YouTube.com, Twitter.com, GooglePlus.com, and Spreaker.com right here for your review and edification. God bless you all. We will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. with more of the Master's Touch E-Crusade 2000. 15.